This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles, unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. More on them in a bit. Racing is one of humanity's oldest sports. At its core is a simple philosophy. Who is the fastest? As mankind advanced, so did the sophistication of the races they ran, from the foot races of the ancient Greek Olympics to the elaborate and violent chariot races at the Circus Maximus in Rome to the elegant boat races between universities such as Harvard and Yale or Oxford and Cambridge. When the automobile was invented at the dawn of the 20th century, it was almost inevitable that people would start racing those as well. Auto racing has grown from an amateur sport of thrill seekers to one of the world's most popular spectacles, helped along by car manufacturers who wanted to show off the capabilities of their machines to the buying public. Racing has driven innovation in car design for the last hundred years as advances made on the racetrack are transferred to the cars that we drive every day. While racing has taken on many forms over the years, there are certain events that stand out in the public mind. Races that provide thrills and boast a legendary pedigree. The high speeds and close action of Indianapolis, Indiana, the picturesque street course of Monaco and in the ancient city of France, and exceptionally long and story track partly purpose-built and partly utilizing existing city streets that tests not only how fast a car is, but how reliable it is. Not to see how fast a car can cover 500 miles, but to see if a car can survive driving for an entire day at full throttle, only stopping to refuel, change tires, and replace the driver. The 24 Hours of Le Mans was the first endurance race, and almost a hundred years after it was first run, it's still considered one of the premier races of not just sports car racing, but of auto racing period, part of the so-called triple crown of motorsport. Le Mans has been the site of some of the world's greatest triumphs, its greatest tragedies, and it's provided the backdrop for the story of the automobile over the course of the last century. Organized auto racing originated in France. The French public had latched onto the motor car with enthusiasm, and car manufacturers sought ways to advertise their products and prove their reliability and performance at the same time. In 1894, a race from Paris to Rouen was organized by the newspaper Le Petit Journal as a publicity stunt for both the car manufacturers and the newspaper itself. Over the next 10 years, racing caught on around the same time the automobile itself did throughout the rest of the world, while in France, the early ad hoc races held on open roads were evolving into organized competitions on closed courses with strict rules to promote fair competition. In 1906, the city of Le Mans hosted the first Grand Prix star race, a format that soon caught on as the most popular form of motorsport. Today's Formula One racing is derived from these early Grand Prix. By the 1920s, there were lots of races all over Europe and America, showcasing the speed of expensive sports cars that were virtually indistinguishable from the ones driven by the public. The Automobile Club de la Quest, or ACO, envisions a different kind of race in their hometown of Le Mans, one that would test not only the speed of the car, but its reliability as well. Grand Prix star races set a specific distance for cars to complete, and whoever finishes it first wins. What the ACO came up with was an endurance race. Cars would drive around the course for 24 hours straight. Whichever car covered the most distance at the end of the 24-hour period and was still running at the end would be the winner. They marked off a course of city streets and country roads in and around Le Mans, today known as the Circuit de la Sarthe, and in May of 1923, the first 24 hours of Le Mans were run. It was an almost entirely French affair, with only two Belgian and one British teams competing against over 30 French cars. It proved to be a success, and the race continued to be held annually. It took on a distinctly nationalistic flavor in the 1930s, as the major countries of Europe viewed success at Le Mans with national prestige. Cars belonging to different countries were painted in distinctive colors. Blue for the French, green for the British, red for the Italians, and silver for the Germans. More and more spectators flocked to Le Mans to see the British Bentleys take on the Italian Italian Alfa Romeos and the French Bugattis. But the Le Mans, along with almost everything else, came to a screeching halt with the outbreak of war.
World War II was not kind to the Cirque de la Sarthe. The course was occupied by the Royal Air Force early in the conflict and then by the Germans when they overran all of France in 1940. The Germans used the racetrack as an airport for fighter planes and over the next four years it was bombed repeatedly by the Allies before the city of Le Mans was liberated in 1944. Before they left, the retreating Germans destroyed whatever facilities were left standing and thus when the war was over, the ACO found their prized race course in complete ruins along with much of the rest of France. Rebuilding a race track was not high on the government's priority list, so the track was left unused for four years after the end of the war. Finally, a combination of government funding and private donations allowed the ACO to reconstruct the track. Parts of the track were now purpose-built for the race course instead of being public road, and the pits and grandstands were rebuilt, and the entire track was repaved. Finally, in June 1949, the first time in ten years, the 24 Hours of Le Mans was run again. The resumed races had a new flavor to them. Great emphasis was placed on innovation, on designs that could be translated to the rebuilding automobile industry in Europe. Cars that could maximize fuel efficiency were particularly prized in a world where gasoline was still rationed, and this led to some rather interesting designs such as this Cadillac designed by American Briggs Cunningham, which was nicknamed Le Monstre by the French press, and it looks like something out of a James Bond film. Auto racing was becoming more organized as individual events were tied together in championship circuits, with a season-ending champion crowns after the events were completed. Grand Prix racing led the way, establishing the Formula One Championship Series in 1950. Sports car racing wasn't far behind, establishing their own world championship in 1953, of which the 24 Hours of Le Mans was a part. Major sports car manufacturers now sent factory teams to compete at Le Mans, not only to attract buyers for their cars, but also to beat the other manufacturers. Competition between the British Jaguar, German Mercedes-Benz, and Italian Alfa Romeo, along with others, was fierce, and speeds continued to increase. But one thing that behind almost all the innovation was safety. And we're going to find out exactly how unsafe early 20th century racing was in just a moment. Spoiler alert, it wasn't safe. But first, a word from today's sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Curiosity Stream is available on many platforms and web apps, including Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, and Apple TV. That's a lot. It's offered worldwide, and it's constantly updated with awesome, timely content. Right now, for instance, they have a popular new documentary series called The Top Science Stories of 2020. Obviously, it features a lot of COVID-19 stuff, but maybe we've had enough of that. It also dives into CRISPR, the Mars rover, fossilized DNA, and other exciting news from the science world that you might have missed. And look, if you're enjoying this video on racing, then why not check out their three seasons of the show What's My Car Worth? There's also the miniseries Beating Death, The Science of Survival, that shows collision specialists explaining the details behind real-life violent car crashes. Right now, you can go to curiositystream.com forward slash geographics for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. Also, it's a great way to support the show keeps us making more videos and let's get back to Le Mans In the 1950s, safety for drivers and spectators who watch races was almost non-existent. The layout of the track at Le Mans was essentially the same in 1953 as it was in 1923, despite the fact that the speeds of the cars had more than doubled in that time span. The pit lane, where cars stopped to be serviced by their pit crews, wasn't separated by any kind of barrier, meaning drivers had to pull directly off the track and into their pit lane. Nothing separated spectators from the track but a 1.2 meter tall earthen embankment. The cars were dangerous too. The fuel tanks were unprotected and tended to rupture during a crash starting a fire. Despite the cars being open-topped, the drivers wore no protective clothing and only a leather helmet and goggles. As incredible as it might seem to us today, they didn't even wear seatbelts. Drivers said that it was better to potentially be thrown clear of a wreck during an accident than to potentially be trapped in a burning car. Taking all of this into account, motor racing really was a disaster waiting to happen. On June 11, 1955, a crowd estimated at 300,000 came out to watch the beginning of the 24 Hours of Le Mans. The spectators were excited as the race was hyped to be a match between Jaguar, headlined by driver Mike Hawthorne, and Mercedes-Benz, headed by two-time Formula One champion Juan Manuel Fangio. Both the green Jaguars and the Mercedes Silver Arrows were fast and employed state-of-the-art designs in their construction. Also driving for Mercedes that year was Pierre Levey, a German driver who almost won Le Mans in 1952 by attempting to drive the entire 24 hours by himself with no relief driver. He was only foiled by a mechanical failure 
in the last hour of the race. The stands were packed with spectators. Overflow crowds milled around right next to the embankment that separated them from the track. Other fans climbed into the rafters of the grandstands to get a better view. As was expected, Jaguar and Mercedes were putting on a show. Hawthorne and Fangio were running first and second very close together as the race entered its third hour. They had begun to overtake slower cars and put them a lap down, including LeVay and Lance Macklin, another journeyman driver behind the wheel of an Austin Healy machine. Just after passing Macklin, Hawthorne came around the corner onto the front stretch of the track where the pit lane was. He saw the signal from his pit crew to come in for fuel. He had seen it late and would need to brake hard to make his pit stall. Hawthorne's Jaguar was equipped with state-of-the-art disc brakes that allowed him to brake much harder and faster than the other cars on the track. Hawthorne's sudden slowdown surprised Macklin, who instinctively swerved to avoid slamming into the back of the Jaguar, inadvertently putting him right in the path of LeVay's Mercedes, who was coming up to pass both cars at full speed. LeVay had absolutely no time to react and crashed into the back of the Austin Healey at 200 kilometers an hour. When LeVay's car hit Macklin's, it acted like a ramp, sending the Mercedes flying into the air. It hit the top of the earthen embankment, bounced over it, and then crashed into a concrete stairwell where it disintegrated. LeVay was thrown from his car and killed instantly when he hit the ground and fractured his skull. The heaviest components of the front of LeVay's car, including the engine block and front suspension, cut a bloody swath through the tightly packed crowd for almost a hundred meters before finally coming to rest. And if you wonder why we're not showing the video here, I mean, you can look it up. It is horrifically violent. The bonnet or hood of the car sliced through the air like a frisbee, decapitating spectators in its path. Meanwhile, the back end of the car exploded into flames, killing and injuring more people nearby. The Mercedes cars were made of a special magnesium alloy that made them super lightweight, but magnesium is also extremely flammable, and the fuel explosion set the entire car on fire and showered the crowd with magnesium embers. Attempts to put the fire out by rescue crews actually made things worse. They used regular fire hoses full of water, burning magnesium when combined with water actually makes the fire bigger thanks to a chemical reaction, and the remains of the Mercedes burned for hours after the accident. Macklin's car ping-ponged between the track and the pit, seriously injuring four people before finally coming to rest. Macklin escaped his wrecked car unhurt, but the carnage around LeVay's vehicle was horrific. Witnesses compared it to the site of a battlefield. Officials knew immediately they had a major catastrophe on their hands. Hundreds of people were dead or wounded. They made the controversial decision not to stop the race. They argued if they had, the roads would have become clogged with people leaving the track, blocking the path of ambulances, taking the injured to hospitals. Most of the spectators left the track not realizing how how bad the accident had been until they returned home. The final tally of the Le Mans disaster was 84 dead and almost 200 injured, many severely. Mercedes-Benz pulled their remaining two cars out of the race and by the end of the year had ended their motorsports program entirely. They wouldn't return to competition until 1989. The disaster had highlighted how woefully inadequate the safety protocols were throughout the racing world, and most of Europe put a temporary ban on all motorsports until safety improvements were made. Le Mans was extensively redesigned, with new grandstands and pit lanes located farther from the racetrack, with safety barriers put in place to protect the crowds. The accident also provided the impetus for safety improvements outside the racetrack as well. John Fitch was Pierre Levey's relief driver at Le Mans. He saw firsthand the carnage, and he spent the rest of his life dedicated to improving safety for drivers. One of his inventions was the Fitch Barrel System, a collection of barrels filled with sand or water that softens a car's impact. The Fitch Barrels were adopted by the American Highway System as an effective and cheap safety device, and are now ubiquitous throughout the country. It is estimated that since they were first put into place in the 1960s, the system has saved as many as 17,000 lives. Le Mans recovered fairly quickly from the horror of the 1955 accidents, and by the 1960s, the event was more popular than ever. Henry Ford II, chairman of the Ford Motor Company, wanted in on the action. The grandson of the legendary car maker Henry Ford thought that his company was in a good position to compete with the European sports car manufacturers and wanted to expand his business on both sides of the Atlantic. Formula One racing was expensive and hard to break into, so he set his sights on sports car racing and he looked for a partner that could help him. Ford, called Hank the Deuce behind his back, went straight to the top of the pile. Ferrari. Enzo Ferrari had built his race team from the ground up after World War II and had grown to dominate both Formula One, winning six championships by 1964, and in sports cars, winning at Le Mans nine times between 1949 and 1965, including six years in a row from 1960 
1965. In an age when car manufacturers went into auto racing to sell more cars to the public, Ferrari went the other direction. He started selling sports cars to the public to earn more money for his race teams. Ferrari was known as Il Commandatore, the commander, because of his autocratic leadership. He had a habit of pitting his drivers against each other in a psychological maneuver to make them drive faster. Ford and Ferrari went into negotiations in the early 1960s. Ford wanted to buy half of Ferrari's company, which Ferrari was amenable to, with one condition. He wanted complete control of the racing division. But Ford was just as much of a control freak as Ferrari was and didn't want Ferraris competing with Ford's efforts at Indianapolis or in NASCAR. Suddenly, Ferrari pulled out of all the negotiations and he later partnered with the Italian car company Fiat. It turned out that he had been playing the two companies against each other to get himself a better deal and Fiat gave him what he wanted. The Deuce was incensed by the snub and decided to go to war with Ferrari on the racetrack. The company designed the GT40 car designed specifically to take on the Ferraris in the sports car divisions, including at Le Mans. Initially, it didn't go well. The cars were uncompetitive and unreliable, and Ferrari continued to dominate. Looking for a change, Ford turned to American sports car designer Carroll Shelby, who had won at Le Mans as a driver in 1959. Shelby made improvements to the design of the GT40, and it immediately paid dividends. Ford beat Ferrari at the 1960 66 Le Mans, though the finish was not without controversy. The Ford cars were running in the first three positions at the end of the race, with no competition threatening behind them. Ford officials saw the opportunity to stage a photo opportunity with all three of their cars crossing the finish line at the same time, and so they ordered their lead car, driven by Ken Miles, to slow down. Because of a quirk in the rules, Miles's car was officially scored second, robbing the team of a well-deserved win. Shelby promised to make it up to Miles the next year, but he never got the chance. Miles was killed two months later, testing a car in California. It was now Ford's turn to dominate at Le Mans. They won in 1967, 68, and 69. While celebrating his win in 1967, driver Dan Gurney sprayed his team with champagne, a tradition that now continues today in most forms of motorsports and in other sports as well. After 1969, Ford abruptly pulled out of all motorsports. They had been facing congressional inquiries about how much research and development was going into racing, as opposed to improving fuel economy and safety in consumer cars. To avoid the bad publicity, they abandoned their racing factory programs immediately. And while they would eventually return to sports like NASCAR, they never went back to Le Mans. But Hang the Deuce's point had been made anyway. Enzo Ferrari never regained his dominance at Le Mans, and in 1973 he abandoned sports car racing altogether to focus on Formula One. To date, the Ford GT40 is the only American car to win at Le Mans. Though the cars continued to get faster, safety for drivers in motorsport continued to lag behind. The safety improvements made at Le Mans in the aftermath of the 1955 disaster were made primarily to protect spectators, and little was done to improve driver safety. The argument was that racing was an inherently dangerous sport. It couldn't be made completely safe, so why even try? Of course, what they meant was why spend the money to try. A perfect example of these outdated safety concerns came at Le Mans in 1969. Since the first running of the race in 1923, it had been tradition to begin the race at Le Mans in a unique way. The cars would be lined up on the pit road with their engines off while the drivers were on the other side of the track. When the French tricolor was waved to begin the race, the drivers would run across the track, leap into their cars, start them, and drive away. This tradition, known as the Le Mans start, persisted for years and was actually the impetus for several design innovations on the part of car manufacturers. For instance, Porsche but the start of their cars at Le Mans, the left side of the steering wheel, so the drivers could start the car with their left hand and work the clutch with their right, saving time at the start of the race. Even Porsche cars built today, over 50 years later, have this unique feature in them. But the Le Mans start proved to be more and more unsafe the faster the cars went. Several drivers were almost run over by other cars over the years, and as the seatbelt systems got more complicated, many drivers opted to save time by only partially fastening them before driving away, or not fastening them at all, leaving them unprotected if they had an accident in the opening laps of the race. In 1969, Jack Eichs, a Belgian driver who would go on to experience great success in both Formula 1 and at Le Mans, protested against the Le Mans start by walking to his car at the start instead of running. He patiently buckled his seatbelt correctly and drove away the last car on the grid. Almost as if to prove a point, a British driver named John Wolfe crashed on the first lap of the race. He was thrown out of the car because he hadn't fastened his seatbelt and 
died later from his injuries. Ix would go on to win the race, the first of six triumphs at Le Mans. The next year, the Le Mans start was abandoned in favor of the running or Indianapolis start, considered to be far safer for the drivers. Drivers would also be killed during races at Le Mans in 1972, 1976, 1981, 1986, all of which probably could have been avoided if adequate safety measures had been in place. Finally, after a series of high-profile deaths across the motorsports world, racing circuits began to take safety more seriously. At Le Mans, the track was redesigned to slow the cars down and keep them from attaining speeds in excess of 400 km per hour, as they had been previously. Improvements both inside the car and on the racetrack have led to safer events for both drivers and spectators. Only two fatal accidents have occurred at Le Mans since 1986, both considered freak accidents that were hard to predict in advance. Another safety advance has been expanding the total team of drivers per car to three drivers instead of two, meaning the drivers are less fatigued and less likely to make mistakes that lead to accidents. As with most motorsports, Le Mans was flooded with money from corporate sponsors that replaced the factory teams of prior decades. More people than ever before are watching Le Mans thanks to extensive TV and internet coverage. The modern era of Le Mans has seen an unprecedented level of dominance from the German cars, in particular Porsche and Audi, which between them have won Le Mans 32 times since 1970. Mercedes-Benz returned to Le Mans for the first time since the 1955 tragedy in 1989, winning for the first time since 1952. But in recent years, it has been Toyota that has swept Le Mans, winning in 2018, 19, and 20. Drivers from other disciplines, including Formula One and IndyCar, continue to race at Le Mans, attempting to match the feat of British driver Graham Hill, the only driver to win the Indianapolis 500, the Monaco Grand Prix, and the 24 Hours of Le Mans, the triple crown of motorsport. From the beginning, Le Mans has served as the ultimate test of both speed and endurance for race cars. Motorsports innovations designed for Le Mans have found their way into consumer cars for the last hundred years, from advanced braking and safety systems to modern experiments with alternative or hybrid fuel types to increase efficiency and reduce environmental impact. All the while, the spectacle has never been more popular worldwide, so at least for the foreseeable future, speed demons will continue to visit this sleepy city in northwestern France annually to test themselves against the ultimate crucible of speed. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor, Q.